So today's guest uh, on Kenya Yoga is Rod Stryker, uh, author of a number of books and uh, founder of Para Yoga and the app for Para Yoga, and a tantric Hatha Yoga practitioner uh, from the US. Uh, so welcome, Rod. Thank you, Adam. Good to be with you. Yes, great to see you. Um, I've listened to quite a few of your talks and podcasts up to this date, so I'm mm. excited to chat with you today. I, mean, I suppose the obvious question to start with is um, just a little bit about your background, because I think you've, you, I mean, you've been in the game of yoga for since you, you know, since university, I think. Like yeah, that's right. Years just, now, right. Just after I started doing yoga when I was 20, um, 1979, and people can do the right. math. Yeah, it's been a long time, about uh, four decades plus. Oh, I mean, you know, I can make it a short story, a long story. The truth is that I, I discovered I couldn't get someone recommended yoga. And now in those days, it was just a completely different idea. It was not to be found mm. anywhere, practically. Mm. It was very on the fringes, you know. And uh, I had been studying philosophy, psychology in college. And uh, I left school uh, through my junior year. I, I kind of got um, uh, disillusioned by academic study. And I was interested in, in both philosophy and psychology. And within six months, I found yoga in a book. And my very first experience of it was an eye opener. It was this, at first I read about it in the great forward by Mr. Iyengar, who's a, one of the more well-known, uh, Hatha yoga teachers of the previous century. Brilliant. And, uh, I really felt like it was caps encapsulating everything I'd want to learn in philosophy and psychology. And it was a merging of the two. And then my third pose, all alone, all by myself, it just blew my world. It just blew my whole world open, you know. Mm. It was just an experience that, that was, um, you know, really, truly changing my life, changed my life. I can remember that third pose. And mm. things started to speed up, and then about five or six months later, it was the first time I studied, no, actually nine months, if I'll be precise. I met my first teacher. I started practicing Kundalini Yoga. I did that on and off sometimes very intensely, sometimes very regularly for about two years. And then I met, then I met a South African yoga master in Los Angeles. And one thing led to the next. I started teaching with them, studying with them, uh, committing to a daily meditation and asana practice. And the snowball kept growing and uh, I was now teaching and uh, this was, I started teaching in 80. And so, um, and I, I was just passionate. And in those days, the yoga was not a career. It was a passion. Mm. And I had the great fortune of really finding yoga masters to study with who understood the depth and the breadth of the tradition. And um, I then started in the early days, led the first teacher training at Yoga Works and in L.A. And L.A. was this cauldron of all these styles of yoga. But I was deeply committed to what I had learned with these teachers which is the depth of the possibility of what yoga was and continued to grow. My inspiration didn't stop and uh, eventually tried to encapsulate what they taught me, called it par para yoga, which is a style of tantric hatha. And uh, the school grew. My, the books came. I wrote, you know, first book took almost seven years to write about the purpose of life and how to use yogic uh, perspectives to fulfill that purpose. As I said, it's not a short answer. And, uh, you know, so it, it continued to grow and has, you know, blessed me throughout my life. The masters. Um, you mentioned the, uh, your teachers a number of times, but I don't ever recall you having said particularly who the masters were that you learned from, who the yoga masters. I know you were, you were practicing quite dynamically. When I see photos of, of, mm -hmm. of you when you're young, you're, you're doing kind of quite, quite dynamic yoga. Yeah, in, intense in its own way. Well, the first, the first, teacher was um, uh, the son of this master who would become my teacher. My first teacher was Alan Finger, who's uh, okay. on the East Coast in the U.S. today. His father had been a student of Yogananda. A lot of listeners will know who Yogananda was, started the Self-Realization Fellowship. <laughs> Shivananda, so when Yogananda passed, he went on to uh, Rishikesh and studied extensively with Shivananda. And then his last teacher was a, a tantric mystic, who lived in a cave for 14 years and then came out enlightened and translated all of Shakespeare into Hindi. And yet he only had mm -hmm. not, he only had nine students. And my 
teacher was one of his nine students and he was, um, you know, one of these kind of sages that comes and goes and is maybe completely in his body or not in his body and magical things are happening around him. Aside from translating all of Shakespeare into Hindi, that's already a bit of magic, I think. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So he was my first teacher and I stayed with them, really studied with them for 19 years. And then later, a second tradition came into my life. And that was the lineage of Swami Rama. He, he uh, I didn't actually meet him. Another kind of yogi wrapped in mystery. He was at one time the Pope of India and went to Oxford, actually, and at one point had family and um, was uh, submitted to tests in the West in the scientific community where he could elevate his heart rate to 300 beats per minute, just standing still. He could be awake and asleep at the same time. He was uh, <laughs> quite, quite profound in terms of his brain waves is what I'm really yeah. referring to. And uh, so he was, um, so those are the, those are the big influences in my life. You know, the third one though, would be the yeah. teachings of Krishnamacharya. A lot of listeners will know him. He's kind of the godfather of Ashtanga yoga, but his breadth of knowledge, he spoke nine languages. He was an herbologist, astrologer. And, and moreover, he developed actually several styles of yoga. Ashtanga becomes the most famous, but he had other approaches to yoga that, are very, very mm -hmm. different than Ashtanga. You, you point out that in my 20s and 30s, I was demonstrating more advanced, fairly advanced poses. I had a healthy ego, and uh, as most 20-year-olds should, you know, think that even though I had meditation as my background, you see a beautiful asana and you want to aspire to do it. Uh, at least I did. And absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, and yeah. I mean, did you ever practice Ashtanga? Because you were... Yeah, at yoga works with Chakamati, right? That's so correct. you must have had a little. That's correct. Little, she uh, insisted yeah, I do it. Mine. Oh, are they yeah, friends of yours? I was going to say, she, she's. Oh, yes, yeah, I know great. Chakamati. Well, I knew Natty, obviously, yeah. and Chuck still. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, my teacher, like, definitely formative influences on my practice. And yeah. Practice. So, you and know, I know Matty wouldn't have let you off the hook without. Um, no, that's exactly you right. Bit, right. You, yeah. you said it exactly right. She said, Roddy, you're, you would be so good in Ashtanga. You have to come to Ashtanga. <laughs> so I tried it. I, I really, I tried. I tried it more than once. And um, uh, one of the teachers who came to Yoga Works in those days was uh, Richard Freeman. And mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. doing, a, and this is not a joke, we did a four and a half hour uh, second series. It was four and a half hours. Um, with Richard, yeah, one, yeah, that's, one day. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, and, that's uh, imaginable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I did it. Um, it wasn't really my thing. It just it wasn't my thing. And you know, even when I was doing like my most physically impressive stuff, my soul was still linked to the meditation until the depths of tantra. Ah. And so, um, mm. um, which are certainly the physical can be a tool, but it's not an endpoint. And then she would say, but Roddy, you know, all of the limbs are in Ashtang, all of the limbs are in Mati. Yeah. We'll agree to disagree on that. Uh, yeah. And, and by the way, oh, yeah, if, if you're close these days, you know. at the very end, yeah. at, you know, more than at the end of her life, but in the last decade or so, she really turned around to become a very avid yeah, meditator. And she was doing Vipassana and yeah, right. absolutely. I know she was. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. That was something that people said and, you know, it's a, you know, everything's included in this one physical practice it's like you know great you know great idea isn't it i'd like to believe that myself theoretically <laughs> but you know potentially yeah. was if potentially created those other limbs it, or he didn't create them but he recognized them and he brought them to life why did he bother if it was all in awesome but <laughs> so no, true, i don't true. know we want to go down that road <laughs> yeah or you've got all these other tools and why just stick to the one tool you know when you've got like a whole, you know, a whole bunch of garage full of tools, right? That's right. Um, well, I, the next thing I was going to ask you, obviously, was um, well, what about Tantra then? What, you know, you, you mentioned Tantra. Now, understanding of Tantra in the general domain is like kind of left, slightly kind of salubrious left-handed practices, um, you know, um, or, often sexually orientated. Um, you know, well, would, you, would you like to... Um, You'd like to yeah, how much time? on your yeah. view of Tantra. How much time do we have? Yeah, just a little overview. Yeah. And I know you're, you, you're calling your Tantra the Shiva Shakti uh, Tantra. So uh, maybe, well, yes, let's... Tantra. Maybe just give a little Tantra and okay. then a little Shiva let's Shakti. Let's do that. Well, uh, actually, the Shiva Shakti yeah. is not mine. That's a, that's a relatively recent development. So 
I actually had to do research on that because you had you had briefed me ahead of time that that might be one of the questions. So I looked it up. I remember when that was happening, and I can speak to that. But let's just try try and take a larger view of tantra for a minute. So sure, tantra it has a lot of meanings, uh, and and one one might want to w- wonder how does sex come into this thing, this lexicon of what's called tantra. And so does asana, and so does pranayama, and so do the chakras, and kundalini yoga, and mantra, and chanting, and alchemy, and herbology, and astronomy, and all sorts of amazing, you know, all of this confluence of all of these wisdoms. Well, tantra, one of the meanings of the word is this body of knowledge. And so when you look at the totality of Veda, Vedic knowledge, you get some idea of what it is because Vedic knowledge includes all the things I've described and much more. There's even surgery and medical science and Ayurveda and all this. So Tantra is this body of knowledge that comes pre-Vedas, but kind of gets buried in the classification that then evolves out of Vedic wisdom. Vedas are begin mm-hmm. about 4,000. So it, has, it, it goes before the Veda. It is. It is actually what's okay. called the pre-Vedic okay. culture. And it was um, the Shastras, these initial bodies of knowledge that are slowly like in a drip, almost dripping out into the, into the Vedic scriptures. The, the Vedas are four basic scriptures. All of that knowledge, a lot of that already exists prior to the writing of those texts. In the old days, they didn't have printing presses. So there was an oral tradition before there was a written tradition. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the fundamental idea of Tantra is how we live, and, I, and it's an overused word in the yoga tradition, it's auspicious. How we live auspicious. Auspicious. Yeah, and, and, mm, and the meaning like of it. the word auspicious mm. is mm. Um, that which attracts happiness and success. Mm. And by the way, the name of the first yogi is Shiva. And Shiva, translated in English, is auspicious. Yoga mm. is the path of attracting mm. happiness mm. and success, but not just in the rarefied space of a practice area, meditation, cushion, yoga mat, temple, but in life. And that's what attracted me so much to the, these teachings that my teachers were giving me was that philosophy and its desire to kind of look at life, it's almost separate from life. And Tantra says, how do we, and this is one of the most profound meanings of the word Tantra, to weave. How do we weave mm. spiritual experience into the fabric of everyday life? And for that, they use all these techniques that are familiar to most yoga students. Asana, pranayama, bandha, mudra, visualization. You go on and on and on. Very little of that is explained in the yoga, yoga sutras, but it's a wealth of knowledge in these scriptures that come, including the Upanishads, for example, where they lay out all, all this knowledge of the koshas and the, all these layers of consciousness and how we access them. And, and the final thing I'll say about it, and then you ask me anything you want, because it's, a, it's such a rich conversation, uh, is that the way I'll, I'll distinguish this for students, and I, I say that yoga, yoga is the science or the methodology that gives rise to knowledge, mainly self-knowledge, right? Tantra... So we want to achieve this highest version of ourselves. The yoga tradition is how do we remove the obstacles to clear seeing so that we can see ourselves and life accurately. That's yoga. Mm -hmm. Still the mind, you can see things clearly. The tantric tradition says, hmm, that's hard to do. There's a practical way that you can speed up the process. And by the way, that's one of the meanings of the word tantra is to accelerate, is to transform your energy. And this is why the methodologies lean a little bit more into the energetics with self-knowledge as the background, whereas yoga leans into the energetics, but the primary focus is self-knowledge. So you have the cultivation of energy versus the cultivation of knowledge. But here's here's what I would say, one more piece. Patanjali Hmm. and yoga, like Ayurveda, like astrology and astronomy and herbs and all of this body of knowledge is actually Tantra. It all comes under Tantra. And they were just, they didn't like the orthodoxy that was happening around the Veda or was being 
only practiced by the priestly class. The tantric said, no, men, women, it's not confined to castes. It's not confined to class. Everyone gets to practice this. This is the people's yoga. And so that's kind of a, a piece of tantra. And la here's the last piece. The whole sexual orientation and this e equivocation of tantra and sex is so... Um, Oh, it's so unsurprising that human beings would do this in as much as mm. it's listen, what would you rather sell? If you had, if there was a commerce to your yoga practice, would you rather sell sit and meditate every day, refine your energy slowly, carefully over years, develop the sensitivity, this higher attunement to subtle forces or have sex. And so by the way, even the idea that they're calling the sexual practices Tantra is already a misnomer. The word for the sexual practices was Maithuna, M-A-I-T-H-U-N-A. -A. Mm. Maithuna means to make mm. two one. That's an interesting mm. approach to sexuality, if you will. And that is one one thousandth of the knowledge yeah. that comes in Tantra. But mm. of course, it's, you know, it's easier to sell and gets people's attention. I guess, I mean, could we say that Tantra is kind of working with the world, whereas traditional kind of yoga practices pre or prior Tantra, say, or, or in between indigenous Tantra totally, culture and totally. Vedic culture are, are essentially kind of transcendent. They're, they're looking to work, you know, it's kind of the neti neti approach, denial of the world, whereas Tantra is embracing. And I think they both go to the same stage, which is essentially a different world. Both are looking for a different world, but Tantra is looking to empower the individual to make that different world in in the very body in the practical body that is 100 percent. as yoga is looking for something it's kind of out there you know 100 percent. Um, well done it's good another way yeah but tantra is kind of continuous isn't it like a, a just continuation and nothing is excluded whereas in yoga you know a lot of stuff is excluded right you have a lot of abstentions pretty much all abstentions really you know if you look at samkhya pretty much everything is abstention really apart from Buddhi, often, you know, I mean, yes, you're, you're giving a beautiful synthesis of it, Adam. You really are. Uh, Thank you. Really, you are. No, seriously, <laughs> I was you just are. Because you said a really, a really interesting stuff on it. I mean, how does it look practically then, Rod? And, uh, you know, in terms of how do we define someone doing Hatha yoga to someone doing a tantric Hatha approach? I'm sure people might be thinking that. Well, it really even depends on the Hatha you're practicing. But let's just, let, we'll, we'll try and generalize. So, instead of just looking at it as, as a physical practice, what really we're doing in a tantric approach to, hot, to asana is cultivating energy, as I said before. There are, they were like, they almost mapped the phenomenon of our own personal evolution. And by doing that, it's essentially this tantric wisdom that illuminates the concept of the chakras. We don't see that in the yoga tradition. There's not a, there's nary any mention of that. There's nothing. That's a tantric philosophy. That's a tantric understanding, a vision. It's a realization in that sense. Uh, so as I move my body, I move in a sequence of postures, maybe the exact same postures, but I do it beginning to do a few different things, which is one cultivate energy. What are the main energies you want to cultivate? There's 72,000 channels in the body. 14 of those are most important. Three are the most important. And the, the middle one, it's called Sushumna. That's all about the awakened state. It's called the, the stream of the sacred. How do we get energy in there? We have to affect the others. Another thing that we do is, listen, this whole notion of Kundalini Yoga is a wonderful idea. The idea here is that we're, you and I are seeing so little of reality. We're, we're seeing a fraction of reality. And so the idea of Kundalini Yoga is there's all of this unknown stuff that actually is, reveals our relationship to the sacred, to the divini to divinity. We're not separate from that divinity. And so what Kundalini Yoga is, is the process of un uh, uh, breaking down the obstacles to seeing the sacred within us. So the second kind of energy cultivation is, you, and this is, this is going to be a radical idea, even for a lot of people who study Kundalini Yoga, is you build vital force at the navel center. 
Why? Because the navel center rules our lower chakras, and this is where we hold most of our personality, attachments, dislikes, fears, ego. And as that starts to break, as we start to kind of break down the psychic density, this energy starts to enliven a recognition of the sacred. And then I would say one other aspect of this is we need to have some, even our own version of what it looks like to have reverence, to have some sense of the sacred. Now, if I bring those three things in, an appreciation for this middle channel, which I open to the balance of left and right, famously alternate nostril breathing, or there's countless variations of that that do the same thing. Build energy around the mid, middle area of the body, not the base of the spine, but the middle area of the body. I have a kind of worldview that says, hmm, it's not all about me. My body is not the end of the universe. It's really the beginning. And how do I bring, uh, how do I bring some appreciation relationship to the source of life, which they believed, this is the tantric view. It's not empty. It's actually full. And even beyond that, it's full of love and beauty. And that's the essence of this world. So I bring that to the classes mm -hmm. I teach. It's energetic using the asanas, the breath, maybe chanting or sound and, um, bandhas and mudras and all of that. And this is how we cultivate it. And it's, it's right out of the scriptures, by the way, the hot thing is, the mm -hmm. hot thing is scriptures are yeah. talking about these things that I'm talking about. It definitely is, but are you going that far? Are you are you looking to cultivate the kundalini and um, you know and, and kind of um, awaken that kundalini energy? Is is that an aim of your class? Slowly, or, or are you more practically minded? No, right? Because I mean, yeah, as we well know, I mean, there's a lot of danger yeah. to doing. Yeah, something. no, slowly. Let's put it slowly. So that's the theory behind it. But we still even bring forward, as is appropriate in tantra, and as these scriptures actually describe, Ayurveda. So there's a kind of sense of how do we stay balanced while we're at the same time building these kinds of energy orientations, you know? I would say, look, if you've been doing it for a while, then your practice has evolved. In general classes, it's very much in the background. So instead of making that the central aim, it's informing the practice by about 10 or 20%. If I'm in a retreat, mm. I can teach it, with, teach with a little more intensity. I can have an eye on everybody, see how they're doing. But the reality is you can go gently and methodically and make, even if you draw 10% of what I just spewed out about the tantric approach, you're going to feel different. The yoga is going to have more power. It's going to have more consequence. And uh, we're going to start becoming aware of parts of ourselves that if we were just doing our body, we wouldn't be getting to. Hmm. I think um, famously, Swami Kripalu had a two-tier system where one system was kind of quite full-on and esoteric, and the other system was a, a general yoga practice for the lay practitioner, right? That's true. When you say the same? Yes. Thing? Are you teaching to a number of levels? Yes, right? but even his, the way mm. you've described, like, the more progressive, gentle, uh, general approach, it was informed by this understanding mm. of what the potential of practice mm. could be. But very sneaky. In other words, it's kind of seamless. People don't know that that's happening. They just feel like, oh, well, this has a bit of a different feeling to it at the end of class. And it's kind of the back door. You kind of, um, it's important what you said, that we're mindful of not uh, going full on, if you will. And uh, th that's why it can be very practical and really done by such a wide variety of people. Yeah, mm, yeah. Mm. I'm curious to how you bring attention to building up focus at the navel, at the Manipura chakra. How do you do that? I mean, are you, are you particularly focused on kind of core postures? Right. Smart. Again, thank you. What does you. a class so, look like with you? You know, I, I hesitate to get really technical, but listen, you can actually do it without having had this conversation about Kundalini Yoga. Because the navel center, mm. according to the esoteric kind of orientation of Tantra, says this is where your positivity is. It's not just transforming, it's transformative, but it's where your positivity is, where your healing forces are activated, where strength and confidence and, uh, and at the same time, compassion is generated. They had, you know, one of the, if you will, one of the names of the, the divine 
in the tantric tradition and throughout India is Rudra, Rudra. And Rudra is this concept mm. of both simultaneously the most compassionate form of Shiva, the most compassionate form of the Lord, means one who cries. So he cries for our ignorance of not knowing ourselves. And at the same time, it's also what is supposed to be the manifest force that we find in lightning and in fire and in the strong winds. So that mm. combination of gentleness and compassion with potency is said to be what's in the navel. So you asked a really wonderful question. You said, well, how do you get there? With You have to be super on it. So there are poses that build apana, the downward moving force. There are poses that build prawn, which is an internalizing and generally upward moving force. And there are ways to begin mm. to just use the breath. If I ask someone to, as they breathe in, to be mindful of not letting their belly completely collapse or drop away from their spine, but just slightly hold it in, five to 10 to 10%, hold it in. What they'll start to, start to see is that the chest moves more quickly, which would normally increase prawn, this inward, upward energy. But you just say now, as you do that, see the breath move towards your belly. And as you begin to repeat that, it actually is beginning to draw prawn downward. Depending if I want to elaborate, I would then use apana increasing poses and once in a while describe this awareness now from the pelvic floor moves upward on exhale. And so that's actually the kind of alchemy of how to do it. And you can do it very subtly and very safely, precisely because the, the transformation is to build energy at the ab, at, in the abdomen. Boy, we're really getting technical tonight. I wasn't, I wasn't aware we were going to do that. All right. That's Our all right. listeners love it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so what starts to happen is rather than getting all bombed out, because a lot of people think Kundalini Yoga is pulling energy from the pelvic floor and just bringing it up. That's not... Mm, I, I really mm. challenge people to find a scripture, an ancient scripture that actually says that. Garan Samahita, Hatha Yoga Pratipika, Rudra Yamala, some of these classic texts describe a more intense version of what I'm uh, kind of detailing here. And so what starts to happen is you start feeling more positive about yourself as this energy starts to get anchored in the, in the abdomen. And it has the subtle effect of starting to transform us at a psychic level, like the load that we carry in, in terms of our doubt, self-doubt, uncertainty, instability, insecurity, and even fear. And um, so mm. that's what bringing this navel energy does. It kind of fortifies you and at the same time transforms the lower chakras. Mm. This is a Hatha Yoga Tantra primer we just did here. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty involved and it's, it certainly seems quite, quite situated in a practical appreciation of life, mm. right? Rather than anything, you know, kind of particularly kind of informed by a mystical or, or devotional vision. I mean, when, where does this fit in in the metaphysical uh, context of yoga, well, you know, in terms of a God or, or Bhakti or anything like that? Are you involved you in know, that as well? Personally, of course, yes. I think it's a very mm. personal the process. And uh, some people have had, you know, the, an orientation or experience with either religion or spirituality that has scarred them. And the last thing they want to do is complicate or even allow their reli like religiosity to come into their yoga practice. Part of the beauty of yoga is it's so, mm. the experience is so immediate, so positive. In a way, for some people, it will be a great departure from their religious scarring, you know. So I'm not, I'm not overt about mm. it. What I, and, and as I said to you earlier, I just said, develop an appreciation for it. Begin to have some reverence for the forces that brought you here. Let, let it be a mystery as to what mm. they look like. It's not, and what I, would in, what I would really offer is what the yoga tradition does very elegantly. It's Ishwara. In other words, it's fill in the blank. It's not, it doesn't have to be a Hindu version of it at all doesn't have to have a Hindu name. And the other thing, though, maybe even more critical, Adam, is this coming to terms with the fact of what is your view of the world? 
is underneath all of this chaos and insanity and unpredictability and fear and 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 uh, uh, division. Is it really, is that all there is, is all that we're seeing? Or is it possible that behind it, there's actually beauty, kind of unseen, the gift of life? You know, a child who's not had any kind of scarring, emotional or psychic scarring, wants to take its next breath. Why? Because life is worth living. There's beauty there. And that's the tantric vision. So perhaps even before you try and impose a religious or spiritual or bhakti kind of idea, you just begin to think, wow, life is a gift. Life is a gift. Even if it's a mess, life is a gift. And and there's there's the, that worldview, the teachings, and I was taught, adopting a tantric worldview is the most important thing, even more so than these kind of esoteric techniques I described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what you're trying to teach is not at all straightforward, and it's quite, and it's quite a mantle you've taken on. Um, over the years, how how what challenges have you faced? How have you adopted and amended your teachings to, you know, to suit the the kind of students you're coming with and the challenges or obstacles that you're facing with it, with students? I'm sure you haven't taught. I mean, you've been teaching for so long. I'm sure you haven't taught the same way. Well, I'm oddly sure enough, I, I actually think let's let's let me just you know I just want to debate that the premise that it's not straightforward. It's not straightforward in the sense like okay. This is a hot yoga class. We have 26 poses. That's it. That's all we're going to be doing. It's all my, it's not exactly. straightforward in that sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. So the interesting is thing I mean. is, this is really telling. And it's part of the answer to the second half of your question, which is, it used to be that people wouldn't come and study with me until they were in their 40s. They had done 20 years of physical yoga. They'd been through a 200-hour training. They learned a little bit about the yoga sutras. But they were, and obviously had become part of their life, but they wanted more. So I had the privilege of kind of getting them in their matriculation phase, right? And then what I noticed about mm. 15 years ago was that they started getting younger and younger. The people who were coming didn't have 20 years of practice. They had 10 years of practice or seven years of practice or five years of practice. I think... The reality is that the questions, the challenges that we face as human beings and more as, as humanity is facing greater and greater challenges. We need better answers. We need answers that are more complete. I haven't stopped teaching. I haven't radically changed my teaching over the years. This is what I learned. And, and I can't tell you, no, I can't, con I don't have the words to convey. It was like, oh, this is, this is it. This is it, man. This is it. It's not just about the body. It's not just about my mind. It's not just about a career, but it's all of that. It's love and relationships and the messiness of everyday life. How This sounds like, and more and more I was finding solutions within these practices to set me on the right course to encounter all of that. You know, I've raised four kids and been married and, you know, it's life. And so what I have found is that people have changed. People need, people need deeper hmm. answers. People are asking themselves, okay, well, hmm. what the hell is this? I mean, you can't stay on social media forever. You can't stay on social media indefinitely and not like be like sick. You know, literally it makes us sick. You know, the science is that it makes us sick. So the answers aren't out there. The answers are in here. And they effectively haven't changed since human beings had five senses and a brain. And once we have security, hmm. We want to know how to conquer our fear, how to be more joyful. How do I conquer fear? And what the teachings say is that the cause of fear is duality. Where you, you pointed that out really brilliantly, honestly. You were so concise in it. How do we bring a different vision of this world? It's not to say I'm, I still have kids. There's still good choices and bad choices. I have to know duality to figure out how to get online with you. I have to, I have to navigate duality, but if that's all I know, then there will always be fear. 
and there will always be a struggle to stay joyful and peace. So the tantric model is, let's not de deny life. How do we empower ourselves to live it fully? So my teaching hasn't changed that much. Mm. You talked about um, how do you incorporate the meditation aspects into it? I mean, is asana enough? Is asana enough? You know, my teacher once said something that still echoes my brain, um, which is he said, um, you know, Rod, and he's Indian, man. He grew up in a small village in India, but he's brilliant. You know, he's just a brilliant man. He's written 19 books, holds two PhDs, lifetime practitioner. And he said, you know, Rod, when I grew up, asana was called asana. And yoga was mantra. So that mantra was actually yoga and asana was called asana. We've done that. We've extrapolated asana practice to mean yoga. So here's something I'd like everyone to think about. Everyone should consider this. You realize like, I don't know how much yoga the Dalai Lama, how much asana the Dalai Lama does, right? But we can assume based on if you just witness who he is and what he is, he knows yoga. He knows the state of yoga. So you can do asana and not know yoga. You can know yoga and not do asana. If we get that down, then you say, okay, well, where do those things meet? Where, where can I do asana and yet know the state of yoga? And that's, you know, your question is uh, that the way I, was taught, I had this gift. I got the gift from my teachers and then was cult and I cultivated it, which is if you do asana in a way, it be meditation becomes seamless. Meditation actually follows. Sitting, in other words, great, you do a back bend practice. There's lots of life force and sensation in this area. Can you follow those sensations to your actual heart? Yes. If I do inversions, for example, or let's say I want to calm my mind, so I want to go third eye, it could well be that an emphasis of inversions might help. If I want to ground more, aid my digestion, and become, you know, become established in some of those positive qualities I described in the navel center, well, maybe I want to do twists and forward bends. Then I sit up afterwards, I listen to the mm. sensation there, and I can move very deeply into that place with a very still mind. So that's the strategy, man. It's really like we are being strategic. Asana is not, I don't think people have to do every asana every time. What are the poses that will help mm. lead you into the kind mm. of mind presence that one, will give you a deep sen deeper sense of yourself, and then two, help empower you to live your life better. So no formal meditation. Practice. Formal. Yes. Did you say yes? Absolutely. Formal as well. For, do you, you're doing four. Yeah. So formal meditation yeah. is part of 100%. the para yoga 100%. teaching. Yeah. 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 Right. right. Hmm. Um, current thinking on the yoga scene, anything that we, you know, we might, we might take in hand going forward. Uh, things that are wrong, things that are right with it? You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I stopped trying to, I stopped trying to manage the yoga scene a long time ago. And I think uh, clearly it's gone, it's gone, even in my lifetime, it's gone through radical shifts. Now we're in this funny place where, you know, people, I think for a while it was so tribal. It was so wonderful. You went to classes, they were packed. We all sweated and were breathing heavy next to each other and our mats were this close. And it was this, it was a tribal kind of event, you know, at festivals, I would teach classes, mm -hmm. there would be 350 people in a room and it's, it was amazing. I actually think the tribe, the, the tribalism of it, just because we are tribal being, we, that's where we came from. I think that the, the meeting of all of this humanity was as important as the yoga we were doing. We, people were drawn to that as much as anything. Mm, good point. You know? Yeah, exactly. But mm -hmm. now that's, that, it's weird. Mm, We've fallen mm. into these times where 
it's it's kind of not all that attractive, you know. I mean, it doesn't have the same allure based on the virus and and uh, and then, as I said, even if we can come together, is what we're doing in that room or in that space beyond the connectivity, the physical sensation of it, is it helping us live with decency? And uh, you know, honestly. Uh, I don't know that the yoga that we've developed, and I'm talking myself included, are we more steady? Are we more steady in our culture of yoga than everybody else? Are we more, are we any less react, reactionary? Are we any less pulled into social media? Are we any, are we, is it any less toxic? And that's a question I think it's fair to ask. You know, especially, especially when you go to the tradition, Patanjali says something rad, really radical about yoga. It's worth everyone just hearing it. He says that the result of asana practice, and now I'm talking asana, not yoga. He uses that language, is that the pairs of opposites cease to have impact. You can look it up. It's in the end of the second chapter. And this is the, this is the Maharishi, you know, the greatest seer of yoga. He says that the pairs of opposites cease to have impact. It means night, day, right, wrong, blue, red, liberal, conservative, you know, um, healthy, unhealthy, death, life, birth, death, rich, poor. We cease to be freaked out by it. And I would just ask us all to consider how are we doing? With that as at the barometer, are we any less freaked out than everybody else? And if we're not, then we have to examine what we're doing as practitioners. Mm. That's really good, yeah. Because half of the time we're kind of doing something, and with an un these days when it's been stripped of particular, you know, religious frameworks, Philosophy. or you know, maybe seriously mm -hmm. kind of tantric. Mm -hmm. framework or philosophy there is this kind of ambivalence about what we're doing yes yeah. it makes you feel a bit yeah. better when you're doing it you know you kind of think or at least it passes some time and then there's a social aspect to it as well and then you mentioned the tribal aspect which 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 definitely hits us somewhere but is it actually fundamentally doing anything effective you know really effective for one's life and i think that's really a, a question that should be in the forefront of any practitioner's mind because you know if it isn't then yeah do a different yeah. yoga or do something else. But, well, you know, there's no time to waste. Is, is, you, know? you know, to be fair, um, it's not like, oh, you just perfect your energy and all is good. I mean, whether it's Patanjali, so you go to the yoga tradition, he says, Svadhyaya, we have to stop blaming the world and take responsibility for our experiences and understand ourselves. So that's self-study, right? In mm. the tantra tradition, they have the term mati, which... That's, uh, you mentioned uh, your closeness to her, but that it, it's in the Sanskrit, it's in the yogic tradition, the Sanskrit word, it means um, to assess, to self-assess, to look inward. So it's the similar idea in both, both approaches. And, you know, mm. it, it's, um, we're, there's a reverberate, human beings, part of our humanity is we have so many, well, we have a reptilian brain that's triggered very easily. And part of it is we have a whole bag, a whole caseload of some scars. You know, we have this inner history that is easily triggered and activated by whatever's happening in the world around us. And, and yet clearly, I really believe that the yoga tradition asks us that when we make mistakes or when we are triggered, we don't just blame everybody but we look inward and we take responsibility for it. And if anything else, yoga is teaching us how to find that steadiness to look inward and to do, to do that work so that the, that the path ahead is, is, is smooth. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, man. Mm. yeah. I think ultimately it builds strength. It's a question then of how you use that strength. So you're talking about the attitude when, which, you know, is the fundamental kind of clincher really. It's like, well, yeah, yes, it will probably build you strength, you know, conviction in your own, right. in your own person, right? right. In your own outlook. But then it's like, well, you know, 
yeah it's your choice how you use it right and then that's the and that's the million dollar question really and why in the way yoga being detached from any fundamental roots is is a bit of a challenge for people right? because it doesn't immediately give out onto a, a clear approach to to what you do with that power i mean in, in, inevitably in the west mm. when you get a bit of power you don't usually think yeah. to give it to yeah, give it no, away that's true. You know, like, or to, to use that's it for true. the sake of truth these days you, you know you get given a bit of power you know most people just want run wild with it as it's true. So, it's true i mean you know but it, you no know, it's, it's absolutely right. it's and, accurate and, yeah. i mean i wanted to bottom that. line listen i would offer <laughs> is just that that we that to your point is that we do remain humble. The thing that I've said again and again and again, and that I've lived by is you mm. never stop being teachable, you know, and, uh, you know, life teaches yes. us who we're meant to be as much as it teaches us who we're not meant to be. You know? A couple of quick fire sure. questions, Rod, sure. just to end up. And we always see this on the podcast, but give us an inspiration, highest uh, inspiration for you just quickly. And a, like a guilty pleasure. Oh, guilty so pleasure. Guilty oh my pleasure. gosh. Okay. Just something you'd say. Uh, so the yeah, first guilty piece. Pleasure. Yeah. Something silly you take pleasure. The first piece is, uh, yeah. what now? is, um, is uh, some high end inspiration. You know, in the end, I really think it, it, uh, it really does become very simple. It really is what will what what prepares you to be kinder and more generous and thoughtful. Uh, again, it doesn't matter standing on my head and doing important poses, you know, impressive poses, I should say. It actually had some meaning at one point in my life. It has no meaning at this point in my life. None. Mm. You know, mm. some of those are still accessible. Yeah. But it's really mm. in the end, it's how can we be kinder? and more generous and more patient and more forgiving. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I, I really think that uh, part of navigating this world in this day and age is about uh, learning greater self-acceptance, to be honest with you, the light and the dark. And just shifting back to our description of Tantra, part of Tantra says um, to see it all as sacred, to accept to accept the dark and to accept the light. And, and I really think we need not only to do that within ourselves, but as we do in ourselves, we could become more capable of doing that in the world. So yeah. that's what I would offer as a bit of inspiration, if you will. Um, yeah. And watch your breathing, <laughs> watch your breathing and never stop being a student. So I, I had to keep going, but uh, so there was more than one. So guilty pleasure, not just pleasure, because I, I write to my, just outside here is my garden. And that's been a huge thing. So for me, I, you know, I don't watch much television, but uh, when I used to travel and now I don't travel near as much as I used to, there are these series of shows here in the mm. States. I, I, I think they've actually crossed over into other parts of the world as well, where they have the, the housewife thing, you know, the, you know, distraught housewives of Atlanta and distraught housewives of Beverly Hills and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, I've my never God. had that. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not a fiend. I don't, I don't binge watch it, but it, it's, it's so shrill. And it's, and it's, and it's so shrill. Pretty and it's also yeah. so fascinating to watch people want to, how much we want to be seen doing outrageous things, you know, how much people are willing to do that. So I find some kind of guilt, guilty pleasure in it, I guess. I don't know. I find pleasure in it in a weird, weird way. I don't watch it a lot. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm over-exaggerating my case for how attached I am to it. I don't think I've seen it. It's pretty good, right? That's a good one. Guilty pleasure. That yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the really first, honest yeah, answer. That's the yeah. Kind of, what are you going like to yeah. say? Yeah. Ice cream. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Hot for Sunday, man. Yeah. No, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, there, there was, there, there's been some TV stuff. Um, I think me and a, 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 another Ashtanga friend of mine oh, said okay. uh, Emily in right. Paris. Uh, I've heard about it. Have you seen that? No. Yeah, yeah. 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 Kind of. Yeah. yeah. Well, sure? well, if you watch The Housewives, <laughs> I'll, I'll tune into that. <laughs> I, I, right. I think what it is is I'll have a look just, just All right. I have spent so much time in my life teaching people not to take small things seriously. It's like, how serious we take the unimportant stuff and how not committed we are to the really important. And 
you know, the fortunate part of the, yeah. the people yeah. I'm around who come, I share most of my company with, they are focused on the important thing. But then it's really good. Like, it's just watching a, a car accident on the side of the road. It's watching people who are absolutely possessed yeah. by what's completely unimportant. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Well, it's been a wonderful chance and opportunity to Th chat with you. Thank, thank you, you for coming Thank on. you for inviting me. I really me. appreciate it. Appreciate it. It's great yeah. to have you. Well done.